Hello and welcome back to Perspectives, bringing you our daily dose of news and views covering the topics we hope are relevant to you. Well, today we look at how India's new controversial law changes have already been abused against a Sikh. Surprise, surprise. Sikh homes deliberately bulldozed in the Punjab by the BJP administration. An interesting story about racism against Sikhs that has backfired spectacularly. And Justin Trudeau welcomes a Punjabi superstar to Canada. And if that's not enough, India itself struggles to come to terms with the latest iteration of the Khalistan referendum. So joining me for Perspectives, as always, is our very own correspondent in Canada, James Cousineau. Good morning, James. Good morning, Angus, and good morning to all of our amazing viewers out there. We don't know what happened, but your comments didn't seem to pour in as they normally do. So reach out to us. Let us know what happened. Uh, if you submitted comments and they didn't appear, by all means, we want to know that as well. So remember that we love your comments and it allows us to interact with you directly. So make sure that you get on there, send us your comments and back to you, Angus. And indeed, James and I together will be bringing you our perspectives on the daily news affecting the Sikh community across the world. Of course, we will be taking a look at your great comments. Thanks so much for those, as always. And we will start off with James, as we usually do. James, what have you got for us today? Well, Dilji Dilsange has made an appearance in Canada once again, selling out one of our biggest facilities and stadiums. He appeared in Toronto, and on that note, he was welcomed by the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau himself. It seems to have shaken a few uh, feathers back in India because they have commented about Prime Minister Justin Trudeau addressing him and, and speaking on Twitter and in person, describing him as a Punjabi artist and entertainer and not an Indian artist or entertainer. So that seems to have ruffled a few feathers, but it is what it is. I mean, I don't get upset when people refer to me as from Vancouver, from British Columbia, or from, you know, Canada. So to me, it's not a big deal. But let's take a look at the at the uh, reports that have come out because he is setting international records for Indian artists performing outside of India. And again, as I stated, he sold out the Rogers facility in Toronto. Here's an image of Justin Trudeau with him on stage, welcoming him back to Canada. He had also sold out Vancouver's largest venue, BC Place Stadium. I believe that was back in April. So it's very exciting to see that he is not only breaking records around the world for an Indian artist, but also in terms of the Indian shows in Canada have never seen such an amazing reception or such a vibrant performance. So let's keep that in mind. For those who don't know Mr. Desange, he is a not only singer and dancer, but he's also an actor who has reaped up some of the biggest box office hits in Bollywood and other cinemas. So it's exciting to see he's really bringing the culture around the world. And again, this is something that Angus and I are focused on with this show is to educate people about the Sikh culture, about the different history and current events. And man, we are not doing anything compared to Diljit Dasanj. My goodness, what an amazing performance that he put on back in Vancouver and again in Toronto. So we look forward to following as he continues to break records around the world for attendance. Back to you over at the studio in London there, Angus. Indeed. Uh, it's, it's great to see this. Actually, I, I see this as a, as, a, as a very good news story. Um, two points I take from this story, um, and this is looking at maybe the bigger picture of this. And firstly, is, is that the feathers ruffled in India because he's referred to as a Punjabi export. I mean, again, we, we've used this word in the past, insecurity. I mean, again, how insecure must the Indian regime be if it's ruffling feathers that he's referred to as a Punjabi, not necessarily an Indian? If you're, um, you know, if you're confident in your nation, you'd be proud that any, any subset of your country is named and applauded. Um, but if you're getting upset about it, it does imply, yeah. and actually we know full well they have this insecurity about the Punjab and they have done since partition. And again, it just reinforces this, this, this 
image of insecurity of the Indian regime, which implies, in turn, weakness in the Indian regime. It implies it is a regime not confident in its own borders, not confident in its own constituent parts. And as we've highlighted on a regular occasion, India is made up of many components, and most of those components are culturally so different to each other. And India only exists because of this artificial creation by the British Empire that, that India or the Indian regime, the ruling elite, cling on to, again, through this extension of mo basically modern day colonialism. So again, this, this reference uh, to ruffle feathers about him being called a Punjabi is just a very subtle manifestation of that very same problem. So that was one takeaway. The other takeaway is great. It's Justin Trudeau um, welcoming him personally. I mean, what an endorsement for the Canadian Sikh community from the Prime Minister of Canada to publicly stand up and welcome this guy with such genuine warmth. I think it, it sends such a message out on many levels. Firstly, locally in Canada, it's telling the Sikh community, I've got your back. I mean, if only we had a British Prime Minister who did something similar, we don't, certainly not yet uh, from the Labour Party. But how wonderful for the Sikh community in Canada to see that genuine extension of warmth from their Prime Minister. And secondly, there's the external message that it sends. It sends a message to India from Canada, from Mr Trudeau saying, <laughs> well, look how I treat my Sikhs, my Sikh community. I welcome them. I am a democratic country and I'm shaking their hand publicly. Uh, what are you doing, India? So yes, James, very, very, uh, uh, to me, a very good news story with some very powerful undercurrents uh, in, in the whole story. Absolutely. And, you know, the people that are judging Trudeau on his comments or on the introduction are, you know, basically saying that he did that intentionally and was sending a subtle message to India. So, you know, I think it was just the excitement of the moment, welcoming such an amazing superstar to Canada. And that's all it was. I really don't think there was more to it than that, no matter who or why they want to read into it further. But on that, as we were talking about a democracy, let's take a look and shift gears over to the referendum vote that will be happening on July the 28th in Calgary, Alberta. On that note, the India government and representatives are pissed off, if I might use that word, but they are in the fact that it's being held at a government uh, facility. Now, the facility that it's being, uh, that they're going to be holding it at, or at least is being reported thus far, is the public plaza at the City of Calgary City Hall. Now, any group can utilize this space. It's not reserved for any other purpose than for public events. It's just a simple process of applying for that date to use the square. There's no permits, you know, required. It's very loosely based for the community. And Sikhs are a great part of the community. So for the other countries, especially for India, to come in and be upset about that is ludicrous when we have a democracy that shares our space with everyone. We don't allow for certain facilities to be utilized by one racial group or one religious group or another. They are there for everyone. There's no discrimination and it's an election. People can vote yes or no when it comes to the Khalistan referendum. They're not being forced to vote in one way or another. So let's face facts that we are a democracy in Canada. People have the right and the privilege of expressing their opinions, of placing a vote, whether it is a Khalistan referendum or a referendum on what color of chocolate should be served at, you know, your dinner. It's just plain and simple. It's just another way for India to basically try to force the opinion or the narrative that Canada is really pushing for an independent Khalistan. That's not the case. We are pushing for the freedom of choice, for the freedom of individuals to have their opinion heard, and for a nation or a community 
to have their independence recognized. And no matter which way that goes, we are open to the democratic process. We encourage Sikhs to go out and vote. We encourage communities to support them. And most of all, we support the freedom to be able to do such. It's part of our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And if India went back or the leadership went back and read their own constitution, they would see that what they're arguing is not in support of their constitution, not in support of democracy, and not in support of the people that they claim to represent. So again, if you are in Calgary or Alberta or in Canada and you want to make your voice heard and you have not yet placed your vote in the Khalistan referendum, as a Sikh, I encourage you to go out and do so. Explore the opportunity of freedom. That's why we call it Canada, because we're all free to take part in things like this. So once again, if you're in Calgary or the area, I will be trying to make it out there for the 28th and for a few days around the event. So if you see me out there, make sure to come up and say hello and to follow the reports that we have from the referendum here on Satledge TV and of course here on Perspectives. With that, I'll send it right back to you in the studio in London, Angus. Yeah, great stuff. Um, it's so good to see uh, the next phase of the, of the referendum. And always, every iteration of the referendum has seen such a great turnout. And of course, always that great, huge sea of yellow Calistan flags. It's, it's very warming to see that. And uh, yeah, we don't know what the results will be, but I think, I think it's, it's looking very likely it will be an overwhelming yes for Calistan. But yeah, this story, I think, again, it comes back to this, this single word I used in the last story, insecurity. If India are um, raising yeah. concerns about using a public building, well, I mean, there's, there's a perfectly rational explanation behind that, which you said, James. But just the very fact that they're raising this, you know, they're saying, why is Canada endorsing this? Well, it's because Canada is a democratic country like you, India, or like you claim to be. And in democratic countries like Canada, like the UK, like the USA, people are free to campaign, as you say, literally about anything they want. If they want to go to bed before nine o'clock and want to have a referendum about that, they can do that. It doesn't matter. And it can be as offensive as you want. As long as it doesn't incite violence or break any laws, you can literally have a referendum about anything you want. And we turn this around. I mean, like the UK, for example, if the British diaspora in Spain, for example, we have a lot of Brits living in Spain, if they suddenly campaigned for a free Yorkshire, which is a part of England, and held a referendum, we'd just laugh and say, you know, enjoy yeah. yourselves, do it, have a referendum. But that's all we would do, because we as a nation are not insecure. But India constantly going on about you know, these concerns about this Khalistan referendum, which is just simply expressing a political opinion, it just again implies that India really has a big problem in its own, in its own confidence, in its own self-belief as a nation, which again implies weakness, which again implies India is just waiting for that catalytic, catalytic event to break it apart, because clearly it is not confident in its own strength as a nation, uh, unless by brute force. And that is effectively what, what Modi is doing. So, um, yeah, and you, you reference to the constitution. Uh, we've talked about the constitution a lot. And even if India tries to pull this whole argument about it, it's against the, the constitution, it's against the territorial integrity of India, etc., etc. The constitution, as we have shown time and time again on this show, it's in many places, it's not worth the paper it's written on because it has been cherry picked yeah. by the BJP government. Whole articles have been just rejected and then rubber stamped by the Supreme Court, Kashmir being one of many examples where the constitution has just basically been ignored or changed to meet current political uh, desires or requirements. So, you know, throwing up any arguments about the constitution just doesn't wash anymore. You, you know, you've lost credibility. The BJP I'm referring to have lost credibility in yeah. in the the words of the constitution. So, and, and I, I would remind people, as, as we all know, Sikhs never signed that constitution. Sikhs are not signatories to that constitution because it did not represent the Sikh community in 1947. It still does not represent the Sikh community in 2024. So, rant over on that one, James. 
Absolutely. We've had referendums and, and votes about separation in terms of the province of Quebec in the past. And let me tell you, people, you know, that uh, went out and placed their votes in the referendum, people that, you know, rallied for support on one side or the other. We didn't care. It was a part of our right and a part of Quebecois right to have that referendum, to have their voices heard. And ultimately, of course, they never did separate. But at the end of the day, they had the right and the freedom to do so. That's the way it is. Yeah, absolutely good point. So let me move on to my uh, first story, which again, uh, let's, let's look at India. And we have brought up uh, on a regular basis these new laws that have been brought in, these draconian new laws and the restructuring of the Indian legal system that has been criticised widely and globally yeah. and even internally about its potential <laughs> restriction of basic human rights, its ability to detain people beyond any, anything that should be acceptable in any democratic nation. So I want to uh, credit Grewal Sequinda, one of our commenters, uh, for highlighting this. We missed this actually at the time when it came up, but um, thank you so much for highlighting. Grewal Sequinda said, every new law being tested on minorities under social media new laws, the first person to book under these new laws is, surprise, surprise, a Sikh, Tajindapal Singh Timur. So thank you for highlighting this story. So this story is, uh, is, is quite shocking actually, and it, it really, I think, just demonstrates uh, perfectly, everything that we have uh, talked about, everything that we have been concerned about these new laws. This refers to uh, a Sikh leader in Rajasthan, Tajindapal Timur. And uh, basically, this gentleman, um, he posted something up on Facebook. Uh, and it's the, the um, one of the Indian newspapers has reported this, and it is across the media, but I'll, I'll just use this article as, as the reference point. And what they say is the Rajasthan police have booked uh, Sikh leader Tajindapal Singh Timur for allegedly uploading a video on social media glorifying Waris Punjab Day chief and radical Sikh preacher Amrit Pal Singh, so radical that he's actually uh, won the majority of support in his constituency, um, who took his oath in the Lok Sabha on July yeah. the 5th. So an FIR, a first information report, this is the first stage of a, of a criminal um, process, an FIR against Timur has been uh, submitted it alleged he made inflammatory anti-national statements and supported those demanding Khalistan, inciting people against the country and the government. And he has been charged, or will be charged, under this new criminal law, the Bharataya Naya Sanhita, the BNS, which forms one of these new three pillars of Indian laws. And these new laws replace these old colonial era, uh, colonial era, uh, Indian Penal Code, the IPC, and in fact, actually, this is wrong. It's not replacing the colonial era uh, uh, penal code. It's actually, it's, it's reinforcing it in many ways. Critics have said, this isn't rewriting colonial British law. It's actually adding to it and making it even more restrictive. So um, the, uh, there's a bit more detail about this story. And this, this is important. This is an important little detail here. Um, it, was, uh, it was lodged against him actually by a rival a gentleman called Lakwinda Singh. Um, and this, this guy, Mr. Lakwinda Singh, has been excommunicated from the Akal Tact. That's the tact up in uh, Amritsar. So this is um, a mischievous submission by this other, one of his rivals. Um, and primarily it's been reinforced by the police, the Civil and Police Administration, because um, this guy, as it says here, was they were, these administrations, the police, were pained by his activism focused on Sikh rights in Rajasthan. So basically, he's been campaigning for Sikh rights in Rajasthan. He's become a nuisance for the police because of his campaigning. And Timur himself said, BJP leaders welcome the slogan of Hindu Rashtra from an MP while taking oath with thumping tables in Parliament House. And this refers, of course, to a story that we covered uh, in the Lok Sabha when an in a new uh, BJP MP shouted Jai Hindu Rashtra when he took his oath, much, uh, much to uh, applause from the BJP members, but much to uh, disgust and outrage from everybody else, because it's not expected that you shout these slogans when you take your oath. And here we're, here's where it gets interesting. The speaker, right. the new speaker of the Lok Sabha, on Birla, after that first session of parliamentary oath-taking, he then instituted a new... Uh, a new law, let's call it, a new, a new rule in the Lok Sabha to say 
that any slogans whilst taking oaths are banned in the Lok Sabha just before Amrit Pal Singh was then finally allowed to take his oath. So uh, the previous BJP MPs during their oaths were allowed to shout whatever slogans they wanted. But as soon as Amrit Pal Singh comes along to take his oath, who of course was going to reply in kind, he probably was going to shout, um, you know, for, for a, a, a Sikh Rashtra, for Khalistan, etc. But no, he's not allowed double standards right. once again. And uh, so the, the article continues. Um, if the accused continues to demand Khalistan, this is part of why he was charged or will be charged. If the accused continues to demand Khalistan, it could incite public outrage, potentially leading to any untoward incident. The accused, Tajindapal Singh Timur, has connections with individuals who demand Khalistan, and he has been sharing his photos and videos with them. Furthermore, he displays Khalistan flags, <gasps> ooh gosh, at various gatherings and events promoting them within the country. This, this is written in the FIR. Uh, now, the, uh, the Jatadar of the attacked Damdana Saeed, Harpreet Singh, has responded to this uh, and said the new criminal laws were being used to suppress minorities. And he wrote himself on Facebook, there was a hunch from the beginning that the new laws might be used to suppress minorities. Well, of course they are. The hunch has been proven true when the Ganganagar police registered a case of treason against Tajindapal Singh Timur under the new laws based on a complaint filed by an anti-Panthic individual. It appears that the first case under these new laws in the entire country has been registered against, surprise, surprise, a Sikh. So there's a lot in this whole story, but basically, uh, does it not just confirm everything that we fear about these new laws? Two things. Firstly, these new laws are now just a license for anybody to use them mischievously to submit an FIR against anybody that they don't like. These, your, these laws are not fair, they are not democratic. They are a license to give anybody who hates any minority an, a, a, an open book to launch an FIR, which of course the police will, will then pursue. And then in right. turn, the laws themselves, how bad are these laws? What this guy has done, and it seems outrageous to anybody here in the West, this guy has made a Facebook post just throwing his support behind Amrit Pal Singh, an elected member of the Lok Sabha because of his support of Khalistan. <laughs> this isn't democracy. This is a banana republic, as, as we refer to it in the West. This is, this is something that you would expect from a third world country in Africa. I'm trying not to insult Africa here, but basically under dicta dictating uh, di dictatorial regimes, under totalitarian regimes, I would expect something like this. Not in India. But then again, we do expect yeah. it from India, James. This is the current state of India. These are the new laws. And of course, the first case brought against these new laws is a Sikh. What a surprise, James. Just another sign that they are continually just trying to up their game in, in trying to silence the Sikhs, trying to really quash anything that goes against what they want and what their goals are as a government. And again, it just shows the lack of support and enforcement of their own own constitution. It's just disgusting how they bend and twist everything and manipulate regulations and rules to support their own agenda. So again, you know, you've got to give it to the Sikhs in terms of credit and respect because no matter what, they keep fighting, they keep struggling to get their independence and they won't be silenced. So, you know, hats off to all Sikhs who whether you agree with Khalistan or not, you express your own opinions and stand up for what's right. So, Exactly. And, and we, we say this often, is that uh, Narendra Modi regularly uh, shakes hands with world leaders and he's praised for being uh, the leader of the world's greatest democracy. He even said in Vienna just the other day, right. He, he shares our values of democracy and the rule of law. And yet, let's compare what's happening here. Somebody, a Sikh in India, has raised the Khalistani flag. He supported the whole concept of Khalistan. But he's, been, he's about to be uh, criminally charged for this. Now let's compare that to the UK and Canada as two simple examples. Uh, Scotland, this is equivalent to somebody in Scotland here in the United Kingdom waving a Scottish flag and demanding that Scotland goes independent and then charging him for that criminal offence. Yeah. 
That's laughable. It's the same in Canada over the whole Quebec issue. It's like uh, the, the equivalent in Canada to the, the Scottish National Party, uh, and James, you can elaborate on this, it's the equivalent of, of a quebec person saying exactly the same thing and being charged with a criminal offence. This is not how democracy works, James, is it, here in the West? No, it's not at all. And again, we can refer back to Quebec. There's also more recently been people in talks or, you know, going on social media for the province of Alberta because they're so energy rich in terms of the oil sands and natural gas resources. You know, people are talking about them breaking off and becoming their own independent, you know, province or nation, whatever you want to call it, in terms of the Albertans. But again, if they came to British Columbia and waved an Alberta flag, hey, good for them. They're proud of who they are. They are proud of what they stand for. And it doesn't mean that they're any less Canadian than I am or someone from Ontario or the Maritimes. I mean, we're all Canadian and we come together. We, as a proud country and individuals, can handle it. Our egos don't shatter when somebody waves an American flag on Canadian soil. We love it. You know, it's patriotism. It's celebrating your background, your culture, your history. And you know what? That's what Canada was built on. That's what democracy was built on. And that's hopefully when next generations look back in India can say that's what our country was built on as they move forward with the respect for each other at some point. Yeah, exactly. And when I go onto Facebook, which I don't very often these days, but when I do go onto Facebook, uh, my feed is filled with Scottish nationalists arguing all sorts of ridiculous arguments about why uh, Scotland should go uh, independent. But I don't demand that they're locked up, that they're criminally charged. I engage them in debate. I argue with them why their case is wrong. Yeah. But that's what democracy uh, demands. It doesn't demand that they are, they are criminally charged. So once again, uh, yeah, unfortunately, this, this is yet another example of India's just uh, it's, it's sad um, decline. It's, it democratic credentials are declining in on the global stage. It, it's, it's very sad and disappointing. So anyway, let's not dwell on that. Let us move forward to my next story. Um, oh, look, more, more, uh, more anti-Sikh um, uh, <laughs> events going on. I don't know why I laugh, but it's just, you know, it's just a common theme here. Um, this is a story uh, from yesterday where the Indian government, and we've reported on this uh, quite a lot in the past, the Indian government has bulldozed several homes of Sikhs that, who have lived in their, in their homes since partition in 1947. So this story, once again, highlighted the intimidation of the Sikh minority in India. And the story is, um, this happened, uh, let's have a look. So the Indian government's destruction of uh, Sikh family homes has seen the Sikh authority body, the SGPC, make a global call for Sikh organisations to condemn the BJP. So this actually happened just a, um, a couple of weeks ago, or three weeks ago. An official government-empowered mob, and it describes them here as far-right goons, um, Harry uh, but also uh, joined by the Haryana police, so this is law enforcement, and state government representatives of the BJP, came to the Amapur village in Haryana and they demolished, they bulldozed the homes of four Sikh families without any notice. So they didn't even have notice to clear out their own possessions. And the official reason for the de demolition was that the homes were not built with adequate permission. 77 years ago, when the family's ancestors moved to Haryana from the side of Punjab, uh, from the Pakistani side of the Punjab during the partition. And Haryana officials claim the houses were built on encroached land which did not belong to them, despite the fact the families have been there since partition without any issues or claims to the land. And uh, the president of the SGPC, Harjinder Singh Dami, has formed a committee specifically to address the situation. Uh, this delegation visited the families to understand the situation on the ground and assured them of the SGP's uh, unwavering support. And, but uh, the guy, or one of the families who lived there, um, the family consisted of four brothers. They migrated from Western Punjab just after partition and had settled in Amupur village. And he said, our ancestors migrated from Pakistan during the partition and settled at this place. But suddenly the government came with police to demolish the houses with no notice. They left us with no shelter, water, electricity or toilet. 
And uh, the SGPC has appealed to human rights organisations and activists to raise their voices against the BJP. And they've also urged uh, Narendra Modi to address his party's harassment of Sikhs in Haryana. Uh, and, and a nice side uh, note to this is the local community have come together to support the families, providing them with langar. Uh, and I talked about langar yesterday. Um, and the Haryana far-right BG BJP government has demolished the homes of other minorities in recent years um, in continuation of the bulldozer politics, which just last August, they forcefully bulldozed over 300 homes in the region. And again, that's something that we reported on. So, yeah, this is an outrageous story. This is a family of Sikhs who've lived in their homes since partition 70 years ago and suddenly find their homes literally with no notice, bulldozers turn up and flatten their homes. There, is, there can be no legal justification for something like this. This is nothing else but pure intimidation. This is something that uh, the, the world is outraged about on a regular basis. When, when e um, Israel, for example, did it to the Palestinians and there was global outrage. Why isn't the world outraged by a similar situation going on where the Indian government, the state, have literally, without notice, without even letting these people take away their possessions, have just turned up with bulldozers, flattened their homes, and now they're homeless. They have nowhere to cook, they've no shelter, etc., etc. And God bless the Sikh community locally who have extended Langar. Basically, they, are, they will shelter and they will feed these poor families. But what, again, this is, this is third world country stuff. This isn't a future superpower. This isn't a democratic nation. I am just horrified that something like this could happen and continues to happen. This isn't the first time this has happened in, uh, in Haryana. This is one of many situations. And it's also happened against Muslim homes as well. Essentially, minorities. This is the Hindu... Uh, RSS extremist nationalists getting their hands on power and this is what they are doing with their power. This is abuse. This is abuse of human beings. There is no defence on any level for this, James, is there? No, not at all. And something that we see in Canada, in the US and probably there in, in a lot of European countries is something we call renovictions. Now, that is essentially, now that the property values have skyrocketed, rental rates have skyrocketed, people who have lived in residences for long-term rentals are being evicted on the premise that the landlord wants to renovate and move in themselves. That gives them a shorter eviction period and time, and then when they get caught not moving in themselves or being, you know, the false pretenses to get the tenants out so they can jack up the rents, they do get penalized, but it's also a tough thing to prove. Now, if you think that is upsetting as a Canadian, as an American, as a European, and so forth, imagine with no notice your landlord showing up, and not even a landlord, a government a representative showing up with a bulldozer and just wiping out the house with all of your personal effects, your your mementos, your you know your keepsakes from generations, just being wiped out and bulldozed in front of you. They've been using this excuse that it is encroaching on public easements and you know that they didn't get the right permits and this and that. But this has been going on for a while. And people, as Angus, you were saying, they don't even get notice in advance. The bulldozer shows up, they're forced out of the home, and then the house just gets wiped right out with all of their personal belongings in it, uh, heirlooms, just, you know, the devastation and the trauma that this causes, not to mention the human rights issues. I mean, it's just a disgusting and deplorable action that should, in today's society, not be allowed anywhere, let alone in a democratic society. Once again, there's that democracy word. Yeah, and I think if, if you take a step back from this, and it, it is very easy to get quite emotional and angry about this story, but if you take a step back and you look a bit more dispassionately at this and look at it from a bigger picture, all the Indian uh, regime are doing are oppressing minorities. And that oppression is again getting worse and worse and worse. The more power that Modi has, the more power that the RSS cements in government, the more this oppression is increasing. And when you increase oppression, it only ever leads to one thing, overthrow of that regime. It leads to breakups of nations. 
So I think the one positive, and the very few positive to take from this awful story, but the one positive from this story is looking at the bigger picture. The more events like this happen, the more the people, and this is where the real power is, the more the people start to eventually fight back. They form organizations, they form uh, groups, they, they, they unite against a regime. And I can foresee the people of India, these, uh, the, these minority groups in these, in these peripheral areas of India where these events are happening, I can see a greater an organization of rebellion, let's call it, of revolt against this. Now, India have got, have got the armed forces, they've got the, the, the sheer brute force power, but ultimately it's people power, particularly in democracies in the modern world, it's people power that overthrow regimes. We've seen it in the Soviet Union, we've seen it in, in East Europe, we've seen it in many Arabic countries. These regimes suddenly fall very quickly when their power just gets too far, when they push their, their, the luck too far. And I can see this happening with Narendra Modi. He's pushing his luck very far now. The world is waking up to this. And I think Sikhs are leading the way with this whole Khalistan issue. I think once again, as history has proven, it's the Sikhs who are standing up against injustice. It's the Sikhs who are standing up against oppression. And I think they are leading the way in, I think, big events to come in India in the, in the, the coming years. So watch this space. Now, I want to move on to my favorite story of the day. And I'm, I'm so pleased I discovered this story. This is a, it's, it's, it's a strange one. And it's actually, this, this occurred in the British press. Um, I think it was yesterday or the day before. And for those uh, who, who don't follow football, there's been a massive tournament in Europe and the European Cup or something. I personally don't follow football, but it's a massive event across, across the whole of Europe. It's a huge competition in football. And uh, England actually reached the finals um, of this competition. So there's been a great buzz uh, throughout the United Kingdom about, uh, or no, <laughs> I'll rephrase that. That's a very controversial statement, not in the whole United Kingdom, in England, a part of the United Kingdom. So it, the English have been very excited about the English team getting to the finals. Unfortunately, we lost, which is a great shame. But beside from that, <clears throat> we have a, a very right-wing newspaper called the Daily Mail. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the Daily Mail is, um, is the mouthpiece of the, uh, the right of centre. Uh, part of the British uh, of British society. It's, it's very conservative, but it also it is also it has a huge comment section, and this comment section right. is where the right wingers in the UK can really uh, air their views. They can, they and very often they make very powerful comments. They make very right wing views. It's I won't go. It's not the RSS equivalent, but it's certainly the right wing equivalent um, of the right wing in India. And there was a recent story. Uh, a, a day or two ago, of a Sikh. And I'll just quickly paraphrase what happened in, in this story. But uh, a, a, a British Sikh, an English Sikh, um, he was called, he's called Jag Singh, he's a young lad, he's 29 years old, he owns a grocery store in the northeast of England. And he was photographed um, on uh, the, uh, they call it the Three Lions, because the, 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 the English logo, the English football team has three lions as, as its logo. So on the Three Lions Instagram page, right. he was photographed um, wearing his turban, but wearing an English shirt. And <clears throat> it received a lot of likes, 400,000 people uh, liked this photograph of, um, of, of this, this Sikh. And uh, the, the official uh, organization who owned the, the Instagram account said, you know, look how diverse our support base is. And the overwhelming majority um, showed support for this. There was one comment on Twitter, X, and a gentleman said, not English, go home. So basically it was a racist comment. And so one person on X under this, this Sikh gentleman's photo wrote, he's not English, go home. Basically, it's a racist remark. Now, shocking, but let's put this into perspective. That's one comment amongst 400,000 who supported this. Now, that's not the story. In itself, that is a small story. The real story, and the reason I wanted to highlight this, it's always been very hard um, to, to try and assess how do the British people feel about the Sikh community? Now, we've supported the Sikh community from our side right. uh, as, as much as we can. But it's very hard to, to get a benchmark, to get a reference point. How do the British people feel about Sikhs in our community? How does the right wing feel about the Sikh community in, in the UK? Let me show you some comments that followed this story. 
Now the first comment, this is the top comment. Jag, this is the Sikh gentleman, Jag was born here. Jag works here. Jag travelled overseas to support his country, England. I wish all my countrymen were as English as Jag. The next comment. The test is this. If we were attacked, the English, who would stand up to be counted? And you can bet your last fiver the Sikhs would be there shoulder to shoulder with everyone else. They are honest, decent, hardworking and respectable. Lovely people, fantastic additions to this country and not the problem. Their philosophy is also inclusive and aligned with British values of tolerance and equality. Don't listen to them, Mr Singh. You keep doing what you're doing. You are a lion through and through. I'll go to the next comment. Served alongside several Sikhs. So this is an ex-forces man who served in the army. I served alongside several Sikhs. They are great people and more patriotic than many of the so-called UK natives. Service to others is embedded in their faith. The next comment. Every Sikh I have ever met is very proud of their heritage. At the same time, very patriotic, which is a great mix. This gentleman is as British as they come. And if I wasn't a Christian, I would become a Sikh. It is a generous religion, but strong and caring at the same time with great history. We all know the comment is from some uneducated lowlife. Next comment, and I'm sorry to read all these, but this gives such a great insight into how uh, white British feel about the Sikh community. The Sikh community may have different traditions than British, but they do not despise British culture and they're not going to terrorise us. Indeed, they will probably defend this country no less than any other true Brit. We have problems from other directions, not this one. Next comment. Good for you, Jag. There are, I won't use the word, all over the world, sadly. Just ignore and enjoy the game and the experience. Next comment. Sikhs are some of the most patriotic people in Britain and thousands died in World War II fighting for Britain. I'm always proud of our Sikh community in Britain. Loyal, patriotic, fierce, skilled fighters in combat and wedded to family and country. They are a joy to have here. If he's supporting England, he has a right to regard himself as an English Sikh. End of. Sikhs are lovely, gentle people. He's not the problem. He's supporting his country and he is incredibly proud of the English football team and so he should be. He's supporting his home country. So there you go. That is just a selection of thousands of comments from white, white right-wing British people. People who don't like immigrants as a general rule. This is what they feel about the British Sikh community. So the Sikh community should stand up and be proud of what they have achieved in Britain. You know, I mean, what a fabulous endorsement of what they have achieved. The, the Sikh diaspora who come to Britain, built their community, they have shared their wonderful values, their wonderful culture in such a positive way that even right-wing Britons are enveloping, they're embracing the Sikh community as their own. Thank you for coming to Britain. Thank you for what you stand for. And thank you for supporting our nation. What a fabulous set of comments. I couldn't say any better, James. No, absolutely not. And we've covered their contributions to the wars, to uh, society, to all aspects of, you know, British, Canadian, American, you know, international societies where they step up and they're the first in to say, how can we help when people are in need? So I love it. I love that they get so much support and that people are praising them and starting to realize what an asset they are to our communities. Yeah, and I didn't realise, I genuinely had no idea how, how the British right wing felt about the Sikh community. Um, but reading right. this, it, it, it's very warming actually to see. Um, it's, uh, yeah, as I say, it's, it's a fabulous snapshot of, of what the Sikh community has achieved in the UK. There are stories of racism, um, but this is the overwhelming majority of right wing. And all those comments, uh, 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 when I I looked at this, you know, the top comments are getting thousands and thousands of upticks. In other words, they are supported by thousands and thousands of people here in the UK. So fabulous. Great story. Re really pleased to see that story. 
Okay, let's move on to our comments now, and uh, which have been now. Well, yeah, one comment here. Um, yeah, yesterday's show for some reason we received almost no comments for for many many hours. Most unusual, and my immediate suspicions were aroused. What is going on online? We do know that the Hindutva online army use any tactics available to them. They are very clever, these people. They have bot factories. They have um, IT specialists working behind the scenes regularly to take down pro-Sikh, pro-Kalistani, anything, uh, any material that supports the Sikh community. They work extremely hard to take these things down. I think Baz, uh, one of the Sikh uh, organizations, one of the, the online outlets, regularly have problems where many of their articles are taken down um, through all sorts of uh, uh, insidious means by Hindutva. So yeah, my immediate thought was, mm, what's going on here? So um, yeah, if you have made comments and it's not appeared, let us know because yeah, we were slightly suspicious. I mean, there are a few comments coming in now, but as, as James referred to in the opening, yeah, we were a bit concerned why there weren't so many comments coming in, which is most unusual, particularly from our regular commenters. So yeah, do let us know your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Anyway, okay, let's take a look at uh, some comments from uh, past few days um, uh, under our secret agenda for Punjab story we did last, uh, last week. The Indian government, uh, this is from Hap B, the Indian government is doing everything it can to cause problems between communities in India. It uses hate speech, it incites violence. Um, he thinks it's disgusting uh, and they think it is acceptable. The whole current BJP government is encouraging violence. Um, and he names Amit Shah, the Home, the home, uh, home Minister, Mo Modi himself, Kangana Ranaut, who we've talked about regularly, and of course the RSS who are behind this. So yes, this comment, absolutely spot on. Um, India, the, the regime, is using divisive politics. It's using the old divide and conquer tactic that actually, ironically, the British were accused of um, during the colonial times. It is simple divide and, divide and rule. That is what the, uh, the RSS uh, driving the BJP are doing. They are dividing communities uh, and ensuring that the, the, uh, the Hindu majority communities turn on the minority communities, the Sikhs, the Christians, the Muslims, etc. So yeah, it's, we, we talk about it all the time. So thank you for, again, highlighting that. Uh, Nix Ram Jat says, yeah, he talks about the intelligence services. We can't trust the research and analysis wing RAW, this intelligence agency of India. Conspiracy favours the conspiracy, uh, conspirator. It's the Indian agency which plans these events to form public opinion to favour their agenda. Indeed, they do. Now, an interesting reference here, RAW and the Pakistan intelligence agency, ISI, work together to suit their agenda. Publics are fools. Who controls the media? Control, they control the narrative. Interesting point of this one. This week, I am going to be interviewing uh, one of our past guests, actually, who has written books. Uh, and one of those books is uh, it's a huge amount of research that this gentleman has done into the collaboration between RAW, the intelligence agency of India, and the Afghanistan intelligence uh, community. And we've reported regularly on potential collaboration between those two intelligence services and of course their respective governments, Taliban and, uh, and Modi's government. Because we've reported in the past that the Indian government is using the Taliban effectively as a proxy to kill Sikhs in Pakistan. Now, um, is the collaboration between ISI, the Pakistan Intelligence Agency, and the Indian Intelligence Agency? Yes, there probably is. But the, the one to really look out yeah. for is what collaboration is going on between Afghanistan and India. That's where the real issue is. And we know that Pakistan and India have, have had a very tense relationship. They've come to war on several occasions since partition. Um, so uh, on paper, they are enemies. It's not unusual for enemies, intelligence services to interact. But I would suggest turn your attention to Afghanistan. That's where the real collaboration is going on. And um, there is talk that India is using Af uh, is, is using Afghanistan as a proxy to also attack what's going on in India, to extend their Indian agenda into <coughs> Pakistan through the Afghan intelligence agencies. So yeah, watch out for that podcast. I'll be interviewing this gentleman um, on Friday. So that'll be uploaded on Friday. But James, yes, I don't know if you have any comments on this, but intelligence agencies, the world over, a uh, clandestine world, an awful lot goes on that we never discover, doesn't it? Absolutely. And we've seen this uh, even recently when we reported on the 
on the actions of the Canadian military and other aid organizations in evacuating uh, Sikhs and other Indians from uh, Afghanistan when the government and militaries pulled, or foreign military and the Western governments pulled out of the region uh, because they faced persecution, execution, and other torture. Uh, so again, you know, it's not something new in terms of you know, Afghanistan flexing their muscle where they can and partnering up with whether it's Pakistan and other countries to get what they want and to build those alliances. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a very interesting history um, since partition <clears throat> between Afghanistan, yeah. Pakistan and India and those intelligence services. So, yeah, right. who, who knows what really is going on behind the scenes. Okay, our next batch of comments. Uh, Harjinder Kondal mentioned, uh, we talked about politics, and we talked about the new incoming Labour government and are they potentially betraying Sikhs? And the, the first comment here, Labour, um, this is the new government, have betrayed before. And now, Angus, they, are, they all MPs are liars to keep up. Yeah, um, I think this is a blanket accusation against MPs that we've talked about, actually. Um, can you trust any MP? Here in the UK, I can probably name MPs on the fingers of one hand who I would genu genuinely trust, who aren't motivated by genuine um, belief in changing the world for the better. I think all the rest are frankly driven by career choice, by money, by power, by the attraction of being an MP, not to make it an interest, not genuinely to represent the interests of their constituents. So yeah, I think your, your accusation is not ill-founded. And will Labour betray us? Well, like we said, we will watch and follow. Um, as I say, the signs so far are not so good as we, as we reported the other day. Um, the, cap, the new cabinet, there were no Sikh faces, there are no Sikh junior ministers. So essentially the Sikh community is not represented in any position of responsibility in the new Labour government anywhere. There are no signs of that changing. So already with 12 Sikh MPs, there are no signs that their voices are going to be represented. There are no signs, or there are plenty of signs, that uh, Keir Starmer is betraying one million plus of his voting base. Not a good start. Uh, now, um, James, yeah, <laughs> we talked, uh, <coughs> we talk, <coughs> talked yesterday about adding timestamps. Uh, cesium iron made this comment yesterday, I brought this up again today, because hopefully, when you look at our description, I inserted chapter points. Um, I had to look up how to do it because it's complicated for somebody as simple as myself. <laughs> but we've added timestamps. And James, when we, when we said at the beginning, why aren't we getting comments? It does cross my mind that maybe in my, in, in my um, inability to understand IT and inability to, to do the technical parts of YouTube, um, I made a mess. Maybe that's why we're not getting many comments. Maybe I've done something wrong technically um, by adding timestamps. And it stopped people commenting. Who knows, James? No, I don't. I don't think that's the case. Uh, you know, it's pretty hard to screw that, <laughs> to screw it up <laughs> unintentionally uh, when it comes to the comments. So again, get your comments out there, folks. We love interacting with you. We love hearing from you. So don't shut us out, please. No. <laughs> so yeah. So th thanks for the suggestion about the timestamps. They are now installed, and we will hopefully continue to do so. Um, <laughs> and hopefully that's not the reason we're not getting comments. Okay, uh, the podcast that, um, that we did uh, over Mahatma Gandhi, um, again, lots of comments. Uh, Amrik Singh commented. Uh, now I wanted to raise this one, Amrik. Uh, Gandhi made a speech in July 1947 in Burlamanda against Sikhs and sparked riots against Muslims. He lied in that speech. Um, I, I wanted to raise it. I, I cannot find this speech. Um, I've looked and he has obviously made a lot of speeches and he did make, make some significant speeches in those, those days of partition. Um, but I cannot find any reference to this. So please um, drop us another comment. Give us a, give us a, a, a bit more to go on because uh, yeah, we, I, we do know and I, we did talk about in this podcast that Mahatma Gandhi did inspire riots at which many Muslims died. Um, and again, this was part of his whole manipulative capability. Um, this specific one I can't find reference to. So please, if you can elaborate on that, I would love to, love to talk more about it. Um, Sukwant uh, made this, uh, this fascinating comment uh, referring to a Sikh officer, a gentleman called Jagat Singh. He slapped Mahatma Gandhi. 
Now, I, again, I had to research this. I thought, wow, really, this is quite a big thing that uh, I, I certainly didn't know about. This gentleman on screen, this is, uh, this is Sikh air officer um, called, uh, what's his name? Gu um, oh, I can't find his last his name, begging my pardon. Uh, Jagat Singh, sorry, I beg your pardon. His name is Jagat Sling, Singh. Um, <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, this, I'll, I'll just read uh, what, what I, found, I discovered about this wonderful gentleman. Mohandas Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, was slapped by Sikh Air Officer, Air Force Officer, for his inappropriate comments against Guru Gobind Singh, the 10th Patisha Ji. Jagat Singh, affiliated with Akand Katani, uh, Jatha, he served in the Air Force. He slapped Gandhi because Gandhi called Guru Sahib Ji a misguided patriot. So what a splendid gentleman. And here he is in his, in his uh, looking magnificent in his Air Force uniform and his turban. What a fabulous uh, story. Uh, you offend my guru, I will slap you. And of course, this refers to uh, um, this, this story we, we talked about the other day, where that uh, security guard in Chandigarh Airport slapped the Bollywood actress. Um, yeah. And uh, because, yeah, this Bollywood actress uh, offended basically the whole Sikh community um, by saying some outrageous things. Right. So, yeah, uh, so this lady, this, this, um, this Sikh lady slapped the Bollywood actress, which basically reflected uh, what this wonderful gentleman, Jagat Singh, did to the, I was going to say the great, no, the infamous Mahatma Gandhi. So salute to you, Jagat Singh. Well done for your, for your act on behalf of the Sikh community. <laughs> James, I, I don't, I don't I'm, think... thinking, I'm thinking that this photo was taken a little bit afterwards because he's not smiling anymore. I'm sure that he had a big <laughs> grin from ear to ear for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I was going to say, maybe we should be going around slapping more uh, more politicians for their, their offensive comments. But actually, no, we don't endorse violence anymore. But one does understand. And of course, we can't, again, we can't compare 20th, 21st century politics in democratic nations to what went on in the 20th century where violence, and, and again, let's get serious about this. Um, we make judgments looking back on the past based through our, our current um, beliefs and, and our, our current environment where violence is not endorsed in any way, shape or form in modern democracies, even though it continues in India. But in, in 1947, yeah. in partition England, uh, India, we mustn't forget in partition, Hundreds of thousands of Muslims and Sikhs and Christians were massacred during this, uh, this partition, this dreadful time in Indian history, when there were these mass migrations of people from east to west and west to east, as people, as India was reshaped. And violence was, was just, not just an everyday, it, it happened almost every minute during that dreadful time. And there were awful scenes of massacre, of carnage of these communities. So one can understand why a simple slap against somebody like Mahatma Gandhi, who was behind this dreadful situation in many cases, one can understand this simple act of a slap. In the context of those days, it was nothing but a simple, loud statement. Now, obviously, when we look back yeah. through the lens of time, it, uh, it appears we laugh about it, but at the time it was nothing compared to the dreadful violence that happened in those days. Right. Uh, this is uh, this going back to one of our older stories, and, and, and I wanted to highlight this. Um, this is our final comment of the day. Avtar Singh, and I, I deliberately wanted to bring up this comment because we have not talked about Avtar Singh Kandar in recent days, if not even weeks. Uh, Avtar Singh Kandar died under suspicious circumstances last year, just over a year ago. And the British government since then have done nothing about it. And Avtar's uh, comment here, the British government right. allowed Indian secret agents into the UK. A Sikh died in Birmingham. Uh, it's suspicious his second post-mortem was not allowed. The police investigation uh, was buried. His mother was denied a visa to come to the funeral, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, so basically, thank you for this comment. You're highlighting what went wrong over this whole thing, that the British state has clearly buried uh, any investigation, any chance of investigation. Why? 
And I, again, I wanted to highlight this comment because we must not let this lie. We must not let this just disappear into the annals of history. We must keep talking about Avtar Singh Kandar, particularly here in the UK. We must hold up the British government to account. We must hold up the, the West Midlands police to account. We must hold up the whole British intelligence uh, services. Why has there been no investigation? Why has this man died under suspicious circumstances and there is no <coughs> visible uh, legal process going on to investigate it? Why is this not happening? Why are people not talking about this in the public domain? Why is the media not talking about this? We will not let this lie on Satlo's TV. We will continue to talk about this. We will not let Avtar Singh Kandar be forgotten. And we will keep our pressure as best as we can from our small voice, but we will keep the pressure up. And I hope the community keeps the pressure up that Avtar Singh Kandar's death will not be forgotten. And the, uh, the transnational repression behind it, that we believe was behind his death, will be held accountable. And the British government will be made aware of what is going on about this. So, James, no, we will continue talking about the martyrs. And of course, in Canada, Hardik Singh Najjar. Absolutely. And again, you know, nothing changes if the voices aren't heard. And it's up to us, not only as individuals, but everyone to make sure their voice is loud enough that it can't be ignored. And that again, you know, we don't, uh, we don't condone violence, we condone peaceful protest, emailing your politicians and just taking a stand and have again, having your voice heard in a peaceful democratic process. Indeed. But on that powerful message, we must bring the show to a close. You have, of course, been watching Perspectives. And don't forget to keep those comments coming in. Please do uh, let us know your thoughts. Uh, it's been really helpful to give us all sorts of pointers to interesting stories like uh, with the first story today that I talked about. It's been very, uh, very helpful for us to, uh, to bring stories that we otherwise might have missed. So do keep those comments coming in. And of course, you can message us directly at message at satlurgetv.com on any items that you would like to send us directly. But in the meantime, you have been watching Perspectives. It is goodbye from me and it's goodbye from James. Stay safe, everyone. Take care and thanks for watching. You have been watching Perspectives. We'll see you next time.